Hi, my name is Lipika Ramaswamy. I'm an applied scientist at Gretel. Gretel is the synthetic data platform for everyone. And today we're going to talk about generating synthetic tabular data that's differentially private. So lots of words there. Let's break it down. Let's start with what is synthetic data. I will borrow a definition from NVIDIA, which is synthetic data is annotated information that computer simulations or algorithms generate as an alternative to real world data. So the data can be of any type. It can be images, can be videos, text, tabular data, rows of a CSV, JSON, whatever it might be. So structured, unstructured, anything. Any type of data can be made synthetic. Now the quality of that synthetic data depends on the type of algorithm that's used to generate it. There are a variety of algorithms that can be used. Um, some of them are statistical, some of them are deep learning based. So you would have commonly heard of generative adversarial networks, um, transformer-based networks, variational autoencoders, diffusion models. On the statistical side, there's probabilistic graphical models, Bayesian networks, copular models. So there's you know, endless possibilities here, and all of these can be mixed and matched. Um, so it's essentially a lot of really cool math that gives us the synthetic data. And the goal of these algorithms is to learn sort of what the underlying distribution of this data is, right? Um, so try to understand what's in the population that's represented by the data and to try to generate samples that look like the data. Now, why might we want to use synthetic data as an alternative to real world data? Um, there are a myriad of reasons. Uh, some of the most common ones that we see at Gretel are folks either don't have enough of a certain type of data. So consider you know, if you're trying to study a rare disease and there are only n number of people in the world who have it. Uh, in order to generate more data, perhaps to perform a statistical study or to, to understand something um, sort of in a mathematical way, you might need more data. And one way of generating that is to you know, go out and find more people with that rare disease, but it may be infeasible to do that. So an alternative might be to pass the, the data that we already have about patients with this rare disease to an algorithm that can understand sort of what the underlying distributions are in that data and try to generate more samples like that. So that's one example. Another example might be there are privacy concerns related to sharing a specific type of data. So you know, again, a healthcare example is if we, um, let's say, we're talking about a hospital um, that has patient records and they want to share it with researchers, but they can't because of privacy concerns. Um, so perhaps synthetic data is a good alternative um, to share data with researchers. Now, one of the hallmarks of synthetic data is that, you know, the, the idea, the motivation is that this data is generated from scratch such that no synthetic sample can be linked back to a single real sample. But there's no easy way to verify that samples indeed cannot be traced back to a single individual. Um, and you know, this is not surprising because really generative models are machine learning models. And it's been well studied and well shown that such models can memorize their inputs during the training process. So it could be that synthetic samples might reveal highly private information. So there, there are no you know, great standardized ways of determining that on a cell by cell basis, but there's a lot of research out there on how we might do that. So privacy is still kind of a concern with synthetic data. We, we can't be, we can't just say, oh, because it doesn't actually you know, perhaps link back on a record by record basis that there's nothing that's revealed about the underlying population. So privacy is, is still quite important and it matters. So some like really quick examples of why this is the case. Uh, for example, from LLMs, an individual's name, email address, phone number, physical address was extracted by researchers. The same thing was done with diffusion models with images. So that's, the, you know, a lot more tangible, it's real, like you can see it, you can see exactly the original images in the generated set. Um, and further with tabular data, you know, it's, uh, it's been shown by researchers that 
the membership of a given individual training record in the training set can be verified by a tax on a tabular synthetic data set. Um, and so, you know, this was tested on a bunch of different models that are GAN-based and um, Bayesian networks-based, variational autoencoders based. Um, and this was all for tabular data. So regardless of the modality of the data, this, there is still a privacy concern. But the good news for us is that if we want to bound that privacy leakage, or if we want to like, give ourselves a number on privacy, we can do that with something called differential privacy. Differential privacy has been around for almost like 17 years now, or maybe more than that. But really the idea behind differential privacy is that if you take an algorithm and it has some inputs, it has some outputs. If you change the inputs by just a little bit, the guarantee of differential privacy is that the outputs don't change by much. And so there's a number that quantifies sort of what the outputs are allowed to change by. Um, and the way this all happens is by the addition of some noise into the process, into the training process of this algorithm. So let's say we're talking about generative algorithms, the input is a data set and the output is, is a data set. And we're saying that if you change the inputs, so let's say you add or remove one record from the input, we're trying to bound how much the output changes. So with differential privacy, you, if you're familiar with it, you might have seen two parameters that are typically associated with it. One is epsilon, um, and that is the ceiling on how much the probability of the output is allowed to change if a single training example is added or removed. The second one is delta, and that's just, it's sort of this external risk that exists no matter what you're doing with your data set. And it's unrestricted by epsilon. So typically we want delta to be very, very, very small. Um, and in the case of these particular models, um, we want them to be smaller than one over the size of the data set and typically a lot smaller than that. And epsilon is typically set to something less than or equal to one theoretically for this definition to work out. Um, of course, in practice, we've seen epsilons up to 10 being used. So with this notion of differential privacy, how do we fit that into generative models? How do we make it work? We can take different mechanisms of differential privacy and add them on top of GANs or variational autoencoders or any neural network based algorithms. And those have been shown to work sometimes, but they require a lot of configuration um, and just a lot of expertise in differential privacy and sort of training neural networks, especially you know things that are unstable like GANs. So what's an alternative? I suggest something called Gretel Tabular DP. So this is a model that we released a few months ago and it's based on work straight out of academia. Um, and it was born from this challenge that the National Institute of Standards and Technology ran um, last decade. And the goal was to try to generate differentially private synthetic tabular data. Um, their, their test bed was census data. Um, and researchers came up with some very, very, very highly performant models for tabular data. And so the idea here, just you know, very briefly, is it's a statistical model. There's no deep learning in here, but it's built with differential privacy in mind. So it's actually able to perform quite well. The idea is it's a three-step process. It contains three steps, select, measure, and estimate. So first, you know, let's say we have a data set. Um, it has you know, n number of columns, m number of rows, and we say, OK, first we're going to see across those n columns, can we select a subset of correlated pairs of variables? So not every single pair of variables, right? Um, we're just selecting a subset using a differentially private algorithm. It's a differentially private version of the minimum spanning tree algorithm. So then we take that and all of those selected subsets of correlated variables and we measure their distribution. So you can think of this as like a massive contingency table, right? Like you have counts, you have a cross tabulation, you have counts of where one value is seen in one column and another value was seen in another column. And we add a little bit of noise to this to maintain differential privacy. 
Um, and so that's, we're basically creating these large contingency tables and they're like multi-dimensional. And using those, we estimate a probabilistic graphical model that captures the relationship that's described by these sort of these very noisy um, measurements. Um, so once we learn that probabilistic graphical model, we can sample from it. And those synthetic samples can sometimes be of very high quality and maintain distributions in the original training set quite well. So this is a solution. Um, it works really well for data that is independent. So no time series data, nothing containing, you know, a lot of different measurements from um, the same person across time, that type of thing. So, uh, you know, just keep in mind, it works really, really well when we have data that is independent across records. So let's, let's try something. Uh, we'll use Gretel to generate synthetic data with Gretel tabular DP. So here I have uh, a data set. It's a data set that contains information on patients who underwent surgery um, for breast cancer. Uh, I got this from Kaggle. Uh, so there's, there's a ton of information on expression levels of different proteins, the stage of the tumor, um, just information about their surgery um, and their status at the end of the surgery or whenever it was measured. So there is some date information here, but there's only one record per patient in there. Um, so, all right, let's take this data set and we're gonna generate a new model with it. All right, um, so I'm using the Gretel console. Now you can use the same thing. It is incredibly quick to sign up um, and use the data set in a project. All right, so here I've selected the tabular DP, DP uh, configuration and all I've supplied is epsilon. So I'm saying, hey, I want a really academic epsilon. I'm gonna use an epsilon of one. Maybe that is kind of on the higher end um, on the academic scale, but we'll start there. And I'm gonna have Gretel automatically determine delta for me. So it's automatically going to set delta to a value that is much smaller than one over the number of records in the data set. All right, and I'm gonna begin training. So this process is pretty quick. Um, a few things to note about this model. This model runs only on a CPU, so it's very efficient and it runs quite fast. Um, so let's look at this data set really quick, right? There's information on age, um, protein levels, so a bunch of float values, a bunch of categorical variables, some dates, and another categorical variable. So uh, fairly straightforward. And we'll see here that we're waiting for a worker to start. Now, so that we don't have to wait for this model to run, um, I've already gone through and run it once. So, all right. Um, so we'll see here the training time was three minutes. For this model, it's exactly the same configuration that we just said, so it's an epsilon of one. And we go to the activity. Here we can see some information in the logs. So, all right, we can see the delta was automatically set to this value, which is 0 0.00016. This is one over the number of records in the data set. There were about 330-ish records. So this is one over 330 raised to a power between one and two. Um, and that's to keep this value of delta really, really small. So our risk, our external risk, we want to really minimize that. Um, so that's what we do with auto this auto set, setting for Delta. All right, so we went through, there were 14 attribute pairs that were selected for measurement. That's great, it's not every attribute pair. Um, and we can see that between the model starting to train, which was 1636 and the model ending, which is 1639, that was three minutes, barely. And the model trained, um, records were sampled incredibly fast. And we have some information on the quality of these records. So this particular data set that we sampled, um, it got a quality score of 85. And this measures three things. One is how well are the correlations in the data set maintained? That's the field correlation stability. The second is deep structure stability, um, which measures sort of like if you look at uh, the principal components of the training set and the synthetic set, how well do those two compare? And the field distribution stability, which looks at one dimensional distributions and how well they were maintained. So. 
this is just a high level overview. You can look at our quality report for more info on that. Another model that I ran was actually using an epsilon that's slightly smaller. So, so let's take a look at that as well. So in the configuration, you can see I set an epsilon of 0.75, again, auto delta. So it should set it to the exact same value. Um, and if I look at the logs and scroll all the way down, you can see that I, I got a synthetic quality score that was slightly less, which is okay. It's still um, marked as excellent. By Gretel, but you can see there's definitely some loss in deep structure stability here. So there is always with differential privacy, always with privacy enhancing technologies, right? The more privacy you get, um, or the more the more privacy that you get in this quantified fashion, um, the more you can expect to perhaps lose in utility or usefulness of the downstream data or rather the accuracy. Um, so there's always the fine balance, but with something like Gretel Tabular DB in under five minutes for a small data set, we've generated synthetic records. Um, so more patients who, or let's say synthetic patients who underwent treatment for breast cancer. And this might be able to provide us with a data set that we can share with researchers. So yeah. Um, Super easy to use. I highly encourage you to, to check it out. The underlying paper for this is very cool. Um, so I would recommend looking at that as well. There's um, it's called marginals based methods for generating synthetic data. And of course, um, we published a blog on Gretel Tabular DP outlining sort of all the details of this model, linking to the paper um, and discussing it at a high level along with some experiments. So. Highly encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions now.